Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Deepak. Uh, I'm a front-end developer at uh, Booking.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, DebugPy. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, modernizing a legacy code base using micro front-ends. Uh, so before I get into uh, the talk, first let's talk. Uh, like, let me talk about the problems with legacy systems, right? Uh, so usually legacy systems are like very tightly coupled. Uh, a change in one part of the system uh, leads something else to break. Usually these systems have a lot of accumulated tech technical debt over the years. Uh, so there's some developer has made some changes uh, and probably has left the company. Uh, there's a lot of undocumented code. Usually these systems are monolith. While there are several advantages and disadvantages of monolith, uh, the biggest disadvantage uh, is a single uh, deployment cycle. Um, and also it leads to uh, slow development, like uh, you usually have to make some change, uh, build the whole project, wait for the build to finish, and then only you can see the change. Uh, and this generally leads to bad developer experience. And whenever uh, we encounter problems like this, the first kind of uh, uh, feeling that we have is rewrite all the code. You know? <laughs> and this is like a very natural reaction for engineers as well, uh, mostly because writing code is way easier than reading someone else's code. I think uh, all of us have uh, you know, uh, kind of can recognize with that feeling. You know, but we, we must like, fight this urge, you know? uh, because Full rewrites are quite dangerous uh, because when you have uh, uh, when you're rewriting a product, the original product is also running in production, right? Uh, and then uh, th uh, that product might have some bugs. You might uh, it might have like new features that needs to be added, and this leads to like a big deviation between the old product and the new product. And you're constantly playing the catch-up game. So usually uh, the management is aware of these risks. So it's also hard to convince them. You know, there's this very interesting use case with uh, Netscape Navigator where uh, they try to do this whole massive rewrite, uh, and they took it took them like around two years, uh, and finally they just lost the browser uh, battle against Internet Explorer. I mean, uh, okay, they rebranded themselves as, Fi as Firefox, but that's a completely different story. Uh, so. To combat this, we use uh, uh, this pattern called a st uh, strangler pattern, which was coined by Martin Fowler during one of his trips to Australia. So a strangler fig is this tree which grows around um, uh, a tree, and it uh, kind of starts taking the shape of the original tree slowly and slowly, while the uh, tree inside uh, just slowly dies out. So this is uh, how it kind of looks like, the tree. And the strangler pattern provides us a way to iteratively move uh, a, a monolith into micro uh, services, right? And this is kind of how it works. So you have the, uh, you use something called as a strangler facade to uh, like abstract away uh, the differences between the legacy and the modern systems. Um, and then the system starts out small. So you, you have like both the legacy and the modern systems running side by side. Um, and then the modern system is very small in size uh, in, in the beginning. Right? Um, and then slowly it grows over time while uh, simultaneously the legacy systems become smaller and smaller and ultimately it's just the modern system that is living. So uh, the advantage of this over a rewrite is that you are just taking pieces from the old to the new uh, instead of uh, waiting, uh, like you know, you're building the new uh, initially and then you do a whole massive switch into the new and then you don't know whether it's like a zero or one, it can fully break, it works wonderfully, you know, like there are a lot of problems involved. So but this kind of provides a good way out of that. Um, and micro frontends are basically uh, microservices for frontend. They're like the microservice analog in the frontend. And we, uh, by using micro frontends, we can use the strangler pattern and apply it to the frontend world. So what are micro frontends? So at the uh, base of it, they are route-based components. So uh, you declare these components using routes. And then uh, you can access them on your page uh, for, uh, by declaring them with these routes. So consider a page like this, where you, the, the white boxes represent the uh, legacy system, and then the green boxes are the uh, components that are built using your modern technical stack. 
So let's look at the uh, like how it kind of works, right? So you have like a templating engine. It can be your uh, PHP, your Perl layer. It can be your Node.js. Like uh, it can be like handlebar templating engine. It can be your Java engine, whatever. So what you uh, do is whenever uh, this templating engine uh, encounters one of these modern components, it makes a request to your modern uh, your micro front end service, right? Uh, and for each of these components, the micro front end says, okay, here's the component, uh, and it gives it back to the uh, templating engine. And what the templating engine then does is it stitches it together uh, in the whole page, and it sends it to the user. So now let's kind of zoom in to the interaction between the templating engine and the micro front end service, right? Uh, and uh, saying exactly w uh, what goes on between there. So the templating engine requests a micro front end service saying that, okay, give me the component A uh, at this route. And then the micro front end service is responsible for giving it the whole component. So let's kind of zoom out and look at what a component is. So a component has a bunch of HTML that, uh, tell, you know, that represents some of the structure. You have some CSS that represents styles. You have JavaScript that represents some behavior. You also have some data that is coming from backend, right? Uh, so the micro front end service is re uh, is responsible for sending uh, each of these individual pieces. Now let's look into detail on how it's done. So for HTML itself, uh, I won't go into it in too much detail because it's just simple server side rendering. You server side render a React app, you uh, you get HTML. So let's look at the next problem: CSS and JavaScript. So uh, before I get into uh, how exactly we are building CSS and JavaScript, first let's look at how, uh, like the different strategies of building assets, right? So there are two, uh, like two trade-offs that we have to make when, whenever we have to bundle files, right? Whether we go with less files or we go with more files. So less files means that we get better compression because to get good compression ratios, uh, like the way compression works is it takes whatever is get, being repeated and it uh, eliminates the repetitions. So to have more of the repetitions, you need to make sure that you have more text, right? So you can only achieve that by having fewer files. Also, fewer, less files means fewer requests, which means like less round trip time and everything. Yeah, okay, let's not get into HTTP2 now. Uh, but yeah, so it generally means that you have fewer requests. But more files means that you have better ca caching, right? Because uh, uh, whenever we split an application, we split it like usually maybe into app and vendor. So where vendor has like all the libraries you're using, like React, Redux, uh, Moment.js, or whatever. Uh, and then you have your app application code. And then whenever you make any changes to your application, you don't uh, make in, like your vendor bundle remains the same. So uh, it is cached for the next time when the user is used. So then you have to decide, okay, now I have an app, do I split it further into multiple apps? Uh, like, you know, your a different entry point for search results, different for home page, whatever. So the more files you have, you get better caching that way. So uh, just continuing on the same line of number of bundles, uh, usually when we talk about standard apps, we optimize for reused bundles. We make sure that the maximum number of code is reused the next time the user comes on the same page. But for micro frontends, the concern is a bit different because we don't know uh, like, uh, like from the get-go what are the files that would be requested at runtime because uh, the templating engine can request any component. right? Uh, so because of that, we need to optimize for loading only what is used by the user. So to do that, we use something called as dynamic imports. And then we use the loadable uh, component library to do that. So what are dynamic imports? So dynamic imports basically is uh, lazy loading uh, JavaScript files. So instead of uh, knowing upfront, uh, like instead of declaring these script files, um, in your HTML, you declare them in your JavaScript, and then you load them dynamically. And we're using loadable component. There's, another, there's also React Lazy, but uh, as you can see by this table, uh, loadable components has way more features, so we go with that. Uh, now let's look at some code. So uh, imagine you have a component called other component, um, and then you want to include it. So what you'd first do is you wrap it around loadable, and then you uh, use a dynamic import and then you uh, call it in your component. So as soon as you do this, 
This, these are the kind of files that are generated, right? So you have your client uh, JS, vendor JS, and vendor CSS, and you also have your other component .chunk .js and other component .chunk .css. So as you can see, you have, we have two classes of files. We have our bundles, and then we have our chunks, right? So the chunks are the uh, uh, they correspond to the files that are uh, dynamically imported. And the bundles are the ones that you statically uh, say that, okay, these are my entry points, these are my vendors, and all of that stuff. Um, and then, the, so once we get our files, now we have to make sure that we have to somehow send it to the user, right? So for that, what we do is we uh, create a new instance of chunk extractor like this. This again comes from loadable. And then we get our HTML in this way. So we have render to string, and then we wrap our uh, app around the chunk extractor manager, and we pass the extractor that we uh, instantiated uh, in the last slide. And then we get our CSS and JavaScript like this. So when the server-side rendering happens, uh, Loadable knows which are the chunks that uh, correspond to the code path. right? Um, so when we extract the CSS and JavaScript like this, we, it spits out uh, like style tags and uh, script tags uh, that actually correspond, I mean link tags, sorry, uh, that actually correspond to uh, the code. Uh, now this is uh, the tags with uh, links in it. It's not uh, actually the whole inline CSS or inline JavaScript. It's, uh, yeah, uh, so it's just the tags with uh, pointing to your script files which are hosted in CDN or whatever. So now let's go back to this diagram and uh, let's see what we have now. So we have our HTML, which was uh, server-side rendered. We have a CSS and we have a JavaScript, which we got from the uh, loadable extractor. Now, once we have these things, the only uh, the natural the next natural course of action is to deal with data. But before we deal with data, we have to first look at these various concerns that come in. Um, the biggest thing with data is that, first of all, we have to fetch the data that is needed. Right? Uh, whenever a, a, a component, like suppose we request for component A, we need to make sure that we get the data that component A needs. The second thing is we need to make sure that we merge the data from different components. So as you saw from this diagram, the templating engine can request for multiple components. right? So you can request for component A and component B. But both of these components are not aware of each other. But they might need the same data. So when that happens, we need to make sure that this data is merged together. The next uh, thing we have to also do is we need to hydrate the data. Uh, we'll come back to what this is. Uh, and we also need to prevent refetching. If some data is fetched on the server, we need to make sure that it's not fetched on the client again. So let's first look at. Uh, how do we fetch the data? So we do that using Redux. So we create a store, uh, we wrap our, com uh, our app in a provider, and then whenever any calls are made, we make sure that the store is populated with the data. So now the store has all the data that we need, and now we have to send it to the client. So we do read store.get state, and then we wrap it around uh, script tags, and then we pass it a unique data attribute. Let's call it data micro front end store. Um, so now we have uh, a tag with, uh, with, with our data in it for, for this component. right? And then we send it over to the client. So now we have HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and data. So everything that uh, the component needs to be rendered is there. But there's still some work to be done on the client. The first most important problem is merging the data, right? Like we like talked about different components, don't know about each other, same data. So we uh, basically get the different instances of data by using a query selector. And then uh, you run a reduce over it. So merge store instances is a custom logic function based on your business case. So you can uh, define how these different data has to be merged. So then uh, we get to hydrate, right? So hydrate, actually, there's two things involved in hydration. So one is uh, we need to make sure that all the data that we fetched on the server, we take that data, and we initialize the 
uh, application on the client with this data. And another part is we need to attach event handlers because all the data that we loaded, uh, like we just loaded the HTML, right? Uh, if there are any on-click events, like some interaction that needs to happen, uh, that is not there currently. So for that, we need to attach event handlers. And to do that, we use uh, two things. So loadable ready, which comes from loadable, and hydrate, which comes from uh, React. So loadable ready uh, runs when all the uh, loadable components have loaded. And then you pass, uh, you call hydrate, which actually you, you give it a DOM ref, so it hydrates your uh, markup with event handlers. Uh, and you uh, notice how I'm also passing the store over here. So the store data is what we got after merging uh, the different data structures, and then this is what we pass over here. So at this point, our application is ready. So let's go over uh, like a quick recap of what we talked about. So we saw how a full rewrite has several problems. Uh, we showed how a strangler pattern provides a path for incremental change. We uh, talked about how micro frontends are like components delivered over HTTP. We uh, kind of took a zoom out and we saw how components are composed of HTML, CSS, and data. We saw different bundle optimization strategies for micro frontends. And we also saw how uh, data in micro frontends can be served. So that's it. Thanks, everyone, for attending my talk. <laughs> <laughs>